production. I have like some pop up to click away. All right, okay. So yeah, so Bidi has already kind of like given you a bit of an outlook for what we're gonna be talking about. Um, it's really posing maybe like one of the like most important questions for linguistics right now, where it's just that there seems to be the impression that large language models have perhaps eaten linguists lunch in the sense that like um, basically 10 years of like engineering work in the in the domain of neural networks has like accomplished more than uh, theoretical linguistics since the like 1950s. So basically is, is linguistics in a position where we've kind of like been left in the dust and have nothing to contribute anymore um, or what's what's the situation? So now, since I'm hosted in the linguistics department, I guess you can already assume that this is not the answer I'm going to give you. So what what is my answer here? Um, well, the first one is that no, like LLMs have not li like left linguistics in in the dust. That's kind of like already a category mistake right there. But more importantly, I think there is lots of opportunities for knowledge transfer in both directions. So I think there's interesting work uh, happening now in linguistics where people are using. Uh, large language models, or like I'm, I'm going to use LLMs as a current in for both large language large language models and like neural network approaches in general. Okay, so um, using that in in various interesting ways, um, but I think there's also ways that linguistics can contribute to um, research in AI and LLM right now, and like some of that is already happening. But I want to basically advocate for an approach that's like a little bit more proactive, not just in terms of like using linguistics to better assess the performance of LLMs, but really using linguistics to inform what kind of like, um, like how we could even look at LLMs and how we could think about what they might be doing and how we could rethink how language works in order to arrive at models that are um, closer to what LLMs might actually be doing, all right? And so in spe specifically what I'm gonna pitch is like the, this approach of subregular syntax, which uh, I have been pushing for the last few years where I think even though that is not motivated at all originally by like taking linguistic insights and comment, kind of relating that to LLM uh, research, it has that as an additional advantage because it gives us a perspective of language where we realize that the things we see in language are actually a lot simpler than one might assume. And that simplicity can be harnessed for LLMs, right? So the way we're gonna go about this is that I'm first gonna like have a very, like nice laid back introductory part where I just want to kind of like make sure we're all on the same page. We're like, what is the general like lay of the land here of like symbolic versus neural computation? And then that's kind of like, once we're like on the same page there and we have like this positive vision of knowledge transfer kind of like have inferred what the possible ways of or, or like synergies between these two areas might be. I'm gonna really switch into like the very concrete technical proposal that I want to make in this talk. So like section two and three, you're gonna notice are gonna ramp up quite a bit in terms of like technicality and like uh, linguistics, but I'm gonna to try to keep it all uh, as approachable as possible. But it means that some stuff I, I won't go into much detail in because it would take us a long time to just wrestle through all the thorny stuff that comes up there. All right, okay. So let's start with the casual part. And let's basically go back to like this whole question of like, Symbolic versus com uh, computation versus neural computation. That's an, an old problem in the sense of like, it's older than me, all right? Um, so the past tense, the bent, uh, past tense debate already started before I was born. And it was kind of like when I recently looked into this again, I was kind of shocked to see that it's still going on. So here I have like a paper from 2002, but you can also find papers from 2016 that still talk about the past tense debate. And so there's actually like this whole debate has like, reached a level where you have this these kind of like graphs that just track of like what papers have been written that respond to what in what way and so on it's like it's this giant thing and all it was was basically the debate with like basically Steven Pinker saying um like morphological inflection for verbs in English is based on rules with a list of exceptions and then other people like uh, Ramon Hart McClellan saying that no we can just do this with neural networks and it kind of like spawned this huge debate, this whole back and forth about like, well, is the neural network actually learning the right thing? Does it generalize? Can we know? Is it like all these things that we're kind of like talking about today, we've already been talking about back in the 80s, right? So it's really an old debate. And like the issues with the past tense debate is the main one is that there's a, the reason it went on for so long is because there's so much um, of people talking past each other. 
and not really like getting what the other side is about. And we still have that nowadays for the very same reasons. So um, earlier this year, um, Noam Chomsky, Ian Roberts, and Jeffrey Wattemol, um, like basically wrote an op-ed piece for the New York Times, which the New York Times gave the kind of like clickbaity title to, where it only emphasizes Noam Chomsky and ignores the other two authors. But it's basically called Noam Chomsky, The False Promise of Chat GPT which um, in its core is actually like a very um, reasonable message, the central message that was basically just to remind people that these machines, as impressive as they might be, are not handling language the way humans are handling language, all right? Which I think that's not a point many people could take umbrage with, but it's a good point to like remind the general public of. But then like the way the whole op-ed piece is actually written, it also like has all kinds of arguments in there that are not as strong or not as like solidly delivered. And so that then got like um, some folks on the on the AI side kind of like into uh, all up in arms. And so for instance, we have um, Scott Aronson on his blog, Shadow Optimized, um, basically posting a reply to false promise of Chomskyism. And it's again, an instance of like completely talking past each other, which you can already see by just looking at like one of the first sentences that is in that piece by, by Scott Aronson, which is um, like it's basically saying, so in this New York Times piece, Chomsky, the intellectual god for the god of an effort that failed for 60 years to build machines that can converse in ordinary language, condemns the effort that succeeded. But that's not at all what the op-ed is about. And it's like, it just shows that like, it, there's a really a case of talking past each other because of course the Chomsky program was never about building machines that can converse in ordinary language. That's an engineering problem, right? Whereas the Chomsky problem was the problem of like understanding how language as a cognitive ability works. And yes, the idea is if you figure that out, eventually that would inform engineering, just like, well, if you figure out how um, classical mechanics works, you can use that for whatever, artillery ballistics or something like that, right? But that's not the point. The point of mechanics is not to allow you to build better guns or something like that, right? So, but that's like, we still have like basically 50 years, oh, 50, but like, let's say 40 years later, we still have this case of like the two communities kind of talking past each other. And that does not mean that the past tense debate was is like in some sense irrelevant or that like the issue of symbolic versus neural computation is irrelevant, right? So, so the SBMC had like a nice comic on that recently. If you could think back to the origins of AI, AI is also not a field of like solving an engineering task. It's a field of trying to understand how the human mind works and using artificial intelligence as a window into that, right? So there's like this nice comic here. I'm just gonna read it out for you guys. So my whole life I've wanted to understand what consciousness is. Now that we can build artificial minds, we will finally get an answer. No more dualism, no more mystery, no waving your hands and saying emergent properties. Oh. We don't know why it works. Neural networks are magic wizard stuff, Son of it, right? So that is a problem, right? It's kind of like we have this disconnect between what the original ambitions of AI are and what the current advances that we're making are actually accomplishing. They're really solving a lot of tasks, but at the same time, since the models are very complex and we don't know how to analyze them, we haven't really gained anything on that side of things, all right? And I don't think that like people in the AI community would actively deny that, but at the same time, it's also not like, yeah. So um, I think there's also general awareness that we would want to have a better understanding of these models, not just because um, it's like basically not just for AI reasons, but also for engineering reasons. So here's like the, um, like a, I'm gonna give you guys a short um, like story here, which is kind of like um, modeled after like a, a metaphor that Stuart Sheba introduced a long time ago. So we're gonna do this real quick, all right? So let's suppose it is the 19th century and airplanes aren't a thing yet, right? And so the, we have a, a, a company, uh, the United States is running a national flight competition and we have three competitors. So first we have Icarus Inc. who wants to achieve flight with um, wax-based wings. Well, that runs into an unfortunate accident once they get too close to the sun and that one fails, all right? Um, then we have Leonardo LLC, um, and that company proposes a kind of like early airplane, but that one doesn't even get off the ground. So that's, yeah, that, that one doesn't work out either. And then we have the third competitor who is little Timmy with his pogo stick. And so relative to the other two guys, Timmy is really knocking it out of the park. He's like 
getting the, the, the greatest heights that you can imagine for the longest time without any deadly accidents in there. Beautiful, great job. And so after Timmy's victory at the national competition, poker sticks are all the rage. We get better and better poker sticks on the market. And by 1930, the United States is the world's leading poker stick nation. Wonderful. Well, and by 1952, the United States is occupied by Japan and Nazi Germany because the poker sticks were no match for airplanes. And also nobody knows what happened to Timmy, unfortunately. Right? So what's the point of the story here? The point of the story is that we don't even like at this point know yet whether LLMs are pogo sticks or airplanes, right? That's what a lot of the debate is about. And we want to be able to assess that. And if they are pogo sticks, we want to figure out what we could do in order to turn them into actual airplanes, right? So we want to get a better understanding of these things. And I think this is kind of like the area where we can have um, like a more positive collaboration going forward rather than just having this constant um, bickering with basically on the one hand, the engineer saying that linguists are not contributing anything meaningful that is really improving the performance of the current day models. And at the same time, linguists saying that contributing to those models will be pointless because they're not actually modeling the real thing. That's not a very fruitful conversation to have. So what would a more positive collaboration look like? Well, the nice thing is that it's actually not quite that much of a hypothetical. If this were like 10 years ago, then I would basically have to talk all in like, we could do this, we could do that. But there are actually things that have happened in recent years that are interesting, I think, for both sides. So one thing that I think is very, very interesting about the large language models is that they model the actual behavior rather than the range of possible behavior. So to give you a few concrete examples, let's talk, uh, for instance, lexical semantics. So in lexical semantics, linguistics was mostly concerned with kind of like what are like the fundamental building blocks of lexical meaning? What kind of like relations between words become um, possible this way? What is like a possible meaning of a word versus an impossible one? Whereas the approach that comes kind of like with LLMs, where you're basically doing distributed lexical semantics, kind of just saying the meaning of a word is the context it occurs in. What you're really talking, what you get is like a model that can talk about the actual relations between words, where you can, for instance, see that the model kind of like um, like the way this works is kind of like you, you, you equate the meaning of a word with a vector in a specific space. And then you can kind of like say the closer the two vectors are together, the more similar they are in meaning. And that gives you like a quantifiable way for measuring similarity, which then seems to track with what we find in psycholinguistic experiments where like human behavior for measuring, uh, for measuring uh, relatedness between words seems to correspond to that kind of thing, right? So this is something where this kind of like the steward approach that comes more out of the neural connection is able to do something that linguistics has not been able to, to do because that wasn't the focus. The focus wasn't so much on like saying for specific lexical items whether they're closely related, uh, related or not. The focus was to say, in general, what is the whole hypothesis space? What is the space of possible meanings and so on? Something similar happens um, with, with pronouns and pronoun resolution. So linguistic theories are going to tell you, if you give it a, a pronoun in a, in a text, the linguistic theories might be able to tell you what the possible reference of the pronoun are, but they really aren't going to tell you what the intended reference is, whereas that is exactly what the LLMs are doing, and they're doing it remarkably well. So when you use something like chat GPT, it is amazing how well it works at pronoun resolution, right? So that is something where linguists could gain some deeper understanding based on what the LLMs are doing. And another one is like word order, where it's kind of like linguistics is a lot about how words can be moved around in a sentence and you still have a well-formed sentence, whereas the LLMs really deal with not so much with like what is in principle a possible word order, but what is a natural word order in this context, right? And so I think that is like a very nice case of complementarity, where we just see that like linguistics in particular Generative linguistics in the uh, Chomsky tradition focuses on the possible range of variation. And that means that there's often a lack of predictive quantifiable theories for actual behavior. But of course, that is something that's still interesting, interesting for engineering purposes, in interesting for scientific purposes. And there's like interesting work that can be done there. And people have started doing this kind of interesting work. I just want to give you like a one, like more specific example. This one is mostly for the, the linguists out there in the audience. So. This is one that has been bugging me for a long time. So it's basically impossible to go through any kind of like uh, linguistics 
introduction, particularly introduction to syntax, sentence structure, without coming across the phenomenon that's called heavy and P shift. So this is something like if you take a sentence like, Mary showed the super fancy car that she bought with a COVID relief check to Sue, that sentence is possible, but what you're gonna get most of the time is actually that this NP gets kind of like, so in this noun phrase, the super fancy car, blah, 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 that I have in brackets there in 1A, that whole noun phrase gets shifted to the right. And so instead you usually get something like Mary showed to Sue, the super fancy car that she bought with her COVID relief check. And so that is a very active research area. And like the research that has been done on that will give you very precise theories of exactly what those syntactic configurations mean, like what exactly are those structural configurations and sentences that allow you to do this kind of shifting of a heavy NP and under what circumstances you cannot do it and what this might tell you about grammar in general and so on. Those are all really, really uh, interesting questions. Recently, we've also like have had more work in linguistics that tries to look a little bit at like other syntactic factors that influence heavy NP shift. So for instance, pragmatic factors, lexical frequency, semantics, stuff like that. But what nobody in the, on the linguistic side is really doing is trying to say, okay, here are all these factors. How can I now put that together into a quantifiable theory of how those all these different factors are weighted and what kind of like preferences that is going to give me for specific sentences, all right? That is not really something that's done. But if you think about it, that's actually something that a theory of heavy and P shift has to be able to do. Whereas most accounts of heavy MP shift, that's kind of ironic, most of them don't even tell you what counts as a heavy MP. They're basically all of the form, let's assume that we have a heavy MP, here's what you can do with it, without ever saying to you, how do I actually determine if I have a heavy MP? What makes an NP heavy? How exactly do I quantify that? And so on. This stuff is not worked out, which I think is a big difference to other fields like, uh, let's say, physics, where when you look at a specific domain, it's not enough to just figure out what are the like relevant laws that interact here and determine what the possible outcomes are, you also need to have a theory that actually quantifies that and is able to give you the correct predictions for specific scenarios. And that's something that we're usually missing in linguistics, but that seems to be exactly what the LLMs are implicitly doing, right? So an LLM does know how to do heavy and P-shift and in what circumstances it should do that. And it usually comes out very naturally. The downside there is that we don't know how they determine that. So we still don't know what factors they've picked up on and how they do the quantification. But that when we like if we figure that out, that is something that would be very useful for, for linguistics, right? So this is one way where I see like um, some kind of collaboration in the future. So and then there's other stuff going on, right? So for instance, linguists are already contributing to the LLM research by assessing their performance. So for instance, my colleague, uh, Jordan Kotner, is a lot involved in these kind of like sigmorphon tasks on inflection, where you basically um, show the model a kind of like limited morphological paradigm and ask it to fill in some gaps in the cells. Um, and so basically what he pointed out and like is that in previous sigmorphon tasks, there were often like confounds in there that allowed the LLMs to behave better than they should. And just assessing their quantitative performance was not quite sufficient. So like he retooled that task, um, made it harder, looked more into like the actual details of the performance and that is insightful stuff to do. Uh, another colleague of mine, Jeff Heinz, for instance, has been doing work where um, rather than testing the LLMs on, directly on natural language data, you test them on formal languages that are modeled after natural language data because that way it's easy to control for confounds and basically rule out that the LLM is just solving the task by paying attention to some kind of like statistical tendencies that don't really have anything to do with the task at hand. And then of course, for instance, uh, at NYU, not too far from Stony Brook, there's Tal Linsen, who's really been doing a lot of work and basically saying, let's pro like test LLMs on specific sentences that are informed by linguistic theory so that we can see how they like handle for instance certain things like binding. So on the binding meaning like, do you have in English something like him or himself? to refer to a specific referent in the discourse or something like that. And so that's all interesting uh, work and it's really great. But one thing I find unsatisfying about this, and this is kind of like where we transition into the second part of the talk, what I find unsatisfying about this is that this is all kind of like reactive instead of proactive. It's kind of like saying, all right, you guys have already come up with various neural architectures and trained them. 
And now we're just going to sit down and run them through our like set of benchmarks and tell you if they did well or not. What I want to like see a little bit more of in linguistics is that we kind of like really think about how can we use linguistic insights to break down complex issues in language and make them like easy to deal with for LLMs. And so I'm going to show you a concrete example of that now. That's kind of like the second half of the talk. So I'm going to show you a concrete example of how that could work for syntax, where one of the big challenges for syntax uh, with syntax for LLMs has been that all of syntax in, in like linguistics kind of like assumes that you have tree structures. And there's the whole question of like, what's the right way of encoding tree structures and things like that, unless you basically just let the LLM do all the encoding itself, right? But what we could do instead is actually like look more closely at how much of the tree structure do we actually need in syntax? And it's going to turn out that you actually, it doesn't look like you ever need the full tree structure. And you're always in a situation where you can take the things that happen in syntax and break it back down to n-gram models. And n-gram models work very, very well with LLMs and like neural architectures in general. So, okay. So here we're done with the casual part. Now everybody like get your thinking glasses on and your thinking hat. We have to like get a little bit more formal. So here's what I'm gonna show you. Um, the logic is basically gonna be as follows. As I just said, n-grams are easy to work with for LLMs, all right? And n-grams, we already know cover a tremendous amount of ground in phonology. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this work that people have been doing with n-grams for phonology, and we're gonna lift it from strings in phonology to trees in syntax, and we're gonna see, hey, these kind of tree n-grams also actually do tons of work for us in syntax. But then we're gonna see that the work they're actually doing for us is such that we can take these tree n-grams and just flatten them back to box standard string n-grams. Well, not box standard, but n-grams over strings rather than trees. Okay, so, and as I said, n-grams are nice for LLMs, so we're kind of like going both uh, full circle there and seeing, hey, that's nice, we might be able to do something cool with that. All right, so here's what we're going to do now. We're going to be looking at what's known as subregular linguistics, where subregular basically means you're dealing with um, patterns that are properly weaker than the regular string languages, so stuff you can define with finite state automata and so on, all right? And we're going to be looking at two specific classes, which are known as SL and TSL, that's short for strictly local and tier based strictly local. And what those guys capture is a certain kind of locality. And that's relevant because locality is probably the most central property of language. Right? And so the specific locality that they capture is that is a locality that is grounded in n-grams of a specific kind. Right? So let me give you an example. Suppose we're doing word final devoicing. So that's the process in German, for instance, where you don't say something like rad, you say rad. So that comes out as kind of like a devoiced um, plosive at the end rather than a fully voiced D. Whereas the plural is rede, where you have the D in there. So basically that means in German, you have this kind of requirement that you can't actually end in the voiced sound like z or d at the end of the word. But that is basically just a, a constraint against illicit biograms. So assume that I give you a string where I've like explicitly marked the edges of the string with the dollar sign. And then I want to see something like, hey, what is actually bad about a string like rad? Well, all you have to do is you move kind of like a sliding window of size two through the string. And the moment you see something forbidden, like a D at the end of the word, you know that the string is illicit. Whereas if I take a well-formed form like say rap, where the, um, we have a voiceless T at the end, you move your sliding window through the string from left to right, and you make it through the whole string without seeing anything illicit, so the string is considered well-formed. Okay? So this is a, an n-gram model because we can basically define this phenomenon of word final devoicing by a list of forbidden n-grams, which are um, in the middle here, where we basically say don't end in z, don't end in v, don't end in d. All right, so basically don't end in these kind of like voiced sounds. And then you don't even like need the full representation of the structure. All you need to know is what are the biograms that occur in it? Are any of those biograms illicit? If yes, then the whole string is illicit. Otherwise it's fine, right? So it's kind of like, imagine like, so imagine really like the way this works is that it's like a, a, an n-gram model, but we don't have probabilities. We just have a split between well-formed n-grams and ill-formed n-grams, and your string must not contain any ill-formed n-grams. Let's do a more complicated example. So something like intervocalic voicing. So that happens, for instance, in Italian, 
which means you cannot have a fricative like S or sh between two vowels, all right? So that just means that what we have here is a constraint that your string must not contain any trigram of the form vowel, voiceless, fricative, and vowel, all right? Or actually, I think it's only sibilance, but it doesn't matter here. All right, so if we look at something ill front like a sola, that's not okay. Why is it not okay? We take our like trigram, um, like basically we extract all the trigrams and we see, boom, there's an illicit trigram in the string. That one's not well formed. Whereas if we look at a well formed string, string like a zola, the way it works here is that um, we can move through the entire string from left to right, look at all the trigrams that occur in it. We never see an illicit trigram, hence the string is well formed. And then how do we account for something that you can still have, um, like something like asociale? Well, there, the, the issue is that we have a morphing boundary, like this plus in there. And so again, if you look at the um, set of trigrams of this string, you never actually see something of the form vowel, s, vowel. All you see is a plus s, plus s, o, s, o, c, and so on. You're not going to find an illicit trigram, right? So this is what it means to be strictly local. It means that a pattern is strictly local if and only if you can basically define it in terms of a list of forbidden n-grams for some fixed length n, all right? So, tons of stuff in phonology is strictly local, um, but there are things that are not. So here's an example, for instance, from Samala, um, where you have long distance sibilant harmony, which means um, basically there's two kinds of sibilants, those that are marked for plus anterior, so those are things like s and z, and minus anterior, which are things like sh and j. And you cannot mix those two things within a word, all right? So you cannot have something like, for instance, has gente la vache. That's not okay. But if you wanted to see that this is not okay, you would really have to look at a very large chunk of structure there. Like, right, your, your um, n-gram would basically have to um, kind of like go all the way from s all the way over here to sh, in order for you to detect that the string contains an illicit matching of a plus interior and a minus interior sound. Um, and that's actually like, that's not even the worst. There's longer words like uh, staya novo novaj, where you would basically need an n-gram of size. What is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 14 grams. That's, that's way too big, all right? Um, it's kind of like, usually you don't really want to go beyond five grams for these kind of things. So what is the alternative? Well, the alternative to say that is this is still local, but you can't, you cannot just look at n-grams that just go like following the successor relation over the string. You have to like look at smarter types of n-grams. What it means in linguistic um, terminology is really we want to look at a tier, all right? So we don't want to look at the whole string. We want to basically ignore all the symbols that do not matter and keep only track of the ones that do. So for instance, we can have a sibilant tier here. All right, and so if we do this, for instance, um, on the sibilant tier, we're gonna only list the symbols that are things like s, sh, z, j, and so on. All the other symbols get ignored. And so we have something like haskin to lavash only get, um, gets the sibilant tier s, sh. And on that, we're back to like just basically using a trigram to detect that, oh, we have an illicit configuration here with an s followed by a sh. Whereas like with the other guy, haskin to lavash, which is well formed, you can like move your biogram um, window through the tier and you're fine, all right? So this is the notion of tier-based strictly local, where the idea is when you find phenomena that are not strictly local over the string, they're gonna be strictly local over a tier of this form, all right? And so here's one thing that's very important to keep my, uh, in mind about tiers. So as linguists, when we might be inclined to say, oh, like the tier is a completely separate structure that we're looking at. But that's not really what, what it is. You can just as well say it's like all you have is that you have a string where you don't just have the successor relation between positions. You also have this kind of like, for instance, sibilant tier relation between guys that allow you to connect elements that are not locally together in the string. And that means it gives you an additional kind of n-grams. You don't just have your standard n-grams over the strings. You also have these n-grams that get to skip symbols. And so that is a familiar concept in, in, in NLP. We do have things like skip n-grams. It's just that in NLP, the skip n-grams are usually defined as something like, oh, I skip every other symbol. Um, whereas here, these skip n-grams work more like, no, no, no. If you're a symbol of a specific type, 
we go immediately to the next symbol of the relevant type. It doesn't matter how many we're skipping in between, right? But it's still a notion of skip n-gram, so very familiar, actually. And so these kind of like SL and TSL patterns, we can kind of like think of as what they're really doing is like, if we think of what an LLM might be doing at the same time, it would be an LLM that kind of like looks at a string and extracts not just the like literal n-grams, like say the literal bigrams that we see, but also certain kinds of skip n-grams, right? And what we're going to see now is that this general approach is actually very flexible. Depending on like how you draw in these kind of relations to be used by skip n grams, you can do very, very powerful stuff directly over strings. So this is what I'm going to show you now very briefly for how it works with syntax. Um, and this is really the hardest part of the presentation. All right. So I hope you guys are still with me. Um, anyway, does anybody would like want to ask a verification question right now before we go into that? No. All right. Then let's just do that. All right. So let's first put in place a few basics. So what is syntax? Syntax means sentence structure. All right. So, and there's many things that go on in syntax, but here I'm giving you like a very like basic outlook to the like two most fundamental properties of syntax. So if I give you a, a sentence like, who does Mary think might buy what? There's two things going on. The first one is that, that we have head argument relations between those lexical items. So for instance, we have that what here is an argument of by, right? And um, we also have that, for instance, who is an argument of by? Who is doing the buying, right? That's what the sentence is arguing about, uh, asking about. So, but who is not really looking in a, uh, like it's not, sitting in a position where it looks to be close to by. What is going on here? Well, that's the other fundamental property of syntax and of sentences, which is that we have displacement. So elements are not always pronounced where they are interpreted. So who is interpreted as the subject of by, which means it should actually be somewhere here, like close to by and something like John bought what or who bought what you see that who is right next to by. But here in the sentence, who does Mary think might buy what? who has somehow moved to the left edge of the sentence, all right? So this is what's um, called like the displacement property. And those are kind of like the two most important things about syntax. There's lots of interesting stuff going on on top of that, but I'm just gonna focus on these two guys here um, because everything else really gets way too complicated. And so just one note on terminology. So if you're kind of like familiar with like more like recent Chomsky approaches, so selection is kind of like what's usually referred to as being handled by the merge operation and displacement is handled by the move operation. And those are the terms I'm gonna be using. So merge means selection for establishing argument relations, move means taking items and pronouncing them somewhere else, all right? And so once you have the, um, like this basis, we also need to decide how exactly we're gonna represent sentence structure. So those of you who are like more familiar with uh, syntax might have seen things like this here. So this is kind of like a, it's known as a phrase structure tree, where who does Mary think might by what gets this kind of like uh, complex structure here. I'm going to be using a different format, um, which for those of you who are closer to NLP, you can kind of think of that as like um, dependency graphs. Um, for the linguists among you, you can kind of think of this as a derivation. So how do you read this? Basically, when you have something like this here with who and what as the daughters of by, this means that what is uh, an argument of by and who is an argument of by. And more specifically, it means that what is what a linguist would call a complement and who is what a linguist would call uh, a specifier. So for instance, that by is the daughter of might means that might selects this whole phrase headed by by as its argument and so on. And then in addition, we have these kind of like branches here, which just indicate um, additional displacement steps that are taking place. Like for instance, that who, um, for reasons that are not like relevant here, first moves to a position next to might and then undergoes um, movement to a position next to does, all right? Okay, and these are these kind of like graphs that I'm using. They're kind of like, again, linguists, you can think of them as like multi-dominance graphs if you want, or you can think of them as derivation trees. They're compatible with many different interpretations. And so I'm going to do one more thing with these guys. I don't really want to be dealing with graphs. I want to have trees just because the math is nicer. So I'm just going to like convert these graphs to trees, which is very easy to do. We basically keep everything the same, except that when we have these kind of like um, branches that indicate displacement, I'm just going to like 
encode their like take away the branches and instead explicitly encode their start point and their their end point. So for instance, this nom branch here disappears and gets replaced by nom minus. And then the fact that it ends in might is encoded by a fact that I have a nom plus here. All right. So this basically allows me to have a tree to deal with. All right. So now what can I do with these kind of guys? What I want to show you is that like once you have these kind of things, merge and move are going to correspond to local constraints over these kind of trees. And not only that, they're going to correspond to some kind of local constraints that we can then backport to constraints on strings. Right? So the first thing to note is that like merge is strictly too local over trees. So that means we only need to look at the mother and its string of daughters to figure out if a merge step is well formed. So if I look at this here, for instance, this is an illicit instance. This would be something like John laughed at picture. So this is where we try to kind of like create a head argument relation between at and picture, but that's not okay because at is looking for arguments that are, um, a linguist would say, a DP, whereas picture is a noun phrase, an NP. And so those two things do not go together. And you can just see that by looking at at and picture directly in the tree, just a mother-daughter relation. Um, we also see some like, this here is not well formed, laughed at Bill because we're missing a subject. And you see that because we know that laughed needs two daughters, but only has one. And we also like similarly see here that la Peter laughed at Bill John is illicit because now laughed has been merged with too many arguments, all right? So these are like local constraints. And this can actually be stringified. By which I mean we can take this constraint over these kind of trees and backport it to a constraint over strings where we use a specific kind of skip and grab. So um, what we do for that is we just say in our strings, we don't just have a relation that connects um, each word to its successor. We also have a relation that connects each head to its string of daughters. And that gives us a kind of like what we might want to call merge engrams. And then all we have to do is, is we check that there are no illicit merge engrams. So I'll give you an example here. If we have something like the string, Mary John doubts that Bill doubts that Sue doubts, meaning like John doubts that Bill doubts that Sue doubts Mary, then we're gonna have the following merge engrams in there. First of all, we're gonna have things like for uh, lexical items with zero arguments, we're just gonna have basically something like say for instance, Mary has no daughters, which I indicate by the dollar sign. So this basically has no arguments at all. And that's okay because Mary doesn't take any arguments. And the same for John, Bill, and Sue. We're also gonna have instances of like these kind of like engrams here um, where we have like that related to doubts because that takes doubts as an argument. And we actually have two instances of that. We have this, that here selecting doubts as an argument and this, that here selecting doubts as an argument. And we also have kind of like the doubt, one instance of doubts is the very root of the, the whole dependency graph. And that's also fine. And then we have like configurations where doubts takes two arguments. So doubts John that, doubts Bill that, doubts Sumeria, right? So these are just these merge engrams that we would have for the string if we use this kind of relation. And notice that this is enough to check whether selection has been carried out correctly. All I need to know here is like, hey, Doubts, for instance, if I look at the two argument case with doubts, John and that, the only question I have is, hey, it looks like doubts has been uh, merged with John and with that, is that actually okay? If it's not, we rule it out. We do not actually need to have the tree structure and notice that there's actually multiple different trees we could build from these n-grams. So um, with these kind of merged n-grams, we could also, for instance, build the sentence, Mary build doubts that John doubts that Sue doubts. And that would still be perfectly okay, all right? So we're not really using the full tree structure here in order to figure out whether we actually have merged heads with their arguments correctly or not, whether we have carried out selection correctly, okay? And we can do something very similar for move. So this is where it gets um, like the most complicated, but the idea is still fairly simple. So suppose that I have something like, hey, John laughed at Bill. And for like specific reasons, we assume that this involves John moving to a position um, somewhere to the left here, um, okay? Kind of like up here. How do I know that this is actually well-formed? Is this a local dependency? Well, just like civil and harmony, it is not directly local because there can be tons of stuff that occurs between a mover and its landing site where it's actually linearized, where it is pronounced. But if we ignore all the stuff that's not relevant for movement, 
then we kind of like get what we could call a movement here. And on that, it's going to be local. So for instance, this whole structure here, if I'm just interested in this kind of subject movement, reduces to the smaller tree tier over here. And here, I just want to know, hey, does my landing site have a mover? Does my mover have a landing site? Um, here's an example that's more complicated. So this is J John complained that Bill slept. Here I have two instances of subject movement. John subject moves up here, Bill subject moves up there. So if I only keep those nodes and remove everything else, I end up with this kind of like tree tier here. But in, again, checking that everything has moved correctly is just a local check between do I have a minus guy matched up with a plus guy and the other way around, right? That's all I care about. Um, if I have multiple movement types, that just means I'm constructing multiple tiers. All right. So here, for instance, where I have a sentence like, who did John complain that Bill slapped? I don't just have movement of uh, subject movement of Bill and subject movement of John. I also have WH movement of who to this very left edge position of the sentence. But again, that is all local over the relevant tiers. I have a tier for subject movement. I have a tier for WH movement. On these tiers, I am strictly too local because I only look at a node and its string of daughters on that tier. So specifically, the kind of constraints that we get from this is um, that only guys that have one of, like if we're looking, for instance, at the, say the WH tier, the constraint would be, only things with WH plus might have a daughter string that contains an item with WH minus, meaning only WH landing sites may have WH movers as daughters on the tier. And the other constraint is every WH plus, so every WH landing site has exactly one WH mover in its tier daughter string. So I mean, like you have, if you're a landing site for, for instance, for a WH movement, you have exactly one thing WH moving to you which is, for instance, what we see here, where it's like this non plus has multiple daughters, but exactly one of them is actually a non minus, i.e. a subject mover, right? Okay. And so here's the like thing that I guess if you're trained in syntax will be really bizarre to you. This can also be stringified because again, what you need there is just um, a different notion of n-gram, a very like elaborate skip n-gram where you say, okay, what we have is a relation where, for instance, if we're looking at the WH tier, each node on the WH tier will be connected to its string um, of um, tier daughters on that tier, except that we actually filter that string of tier daughters to only pay attention to the guys that are F minus. So if I go back here, for instance, this kind of like um, node here with a non plus, in the string, I only want to relate this to John. I have no interest in relating it to like this guy with non plus because that's not actually relevant for the dependency. And so there's a specific formal way you can do that, which essentially is again, just a kind of like tier projection. And so if you do that, um, if we have something like, for instance, the WH n-grams for who, what did John say that bought, which is illicit because both who and what are trying to move to the same WH landing site. Those are kind of like, here are the n-grams that we get. We get that at the very top, we have uh, did with a WH plus feature. Then we have did WH plus with two um, tier daughters underneath who and what, and that's the illicit part. You're not allowed to have both who and what. And then we also have who just having nothing underneath, which is fine, and what having nothing underneath, that's fine. And so again, if you look at this, just those four n-grams are not at all enough to actually reconstruct the like nature of the movement that has taken place, right? So we're really dealing with a more impoverished representation that does not encode all the information that is in a tree, but is sufficient to actually handle this kind of like constraint of movement, all right? And so this general strategy, which I've only like illustrated very simply here, is really not limited to just merge and move, meaning it's not just limited to selection and displacement. So I've looked at many different phenomena in syntax, like island effects, agreement with like upward downward defective intervention. So my uh, student Kenneth Hansen has done lots of work on that. Um, He's also looked at case assignment. I've looked at WH agreement in Irish, extraction morphology, uh, morphology in Wolof and Chumash, German WH copying, multiple WH movement in Bulgarian and Russian, MPI licensing, binding. Not all of these things might mean anything to you, but they're very complicated linguistic phenomena. And they all have this property that like linguists usually handle them over the full tree structure. 
But once you start really digging in and looking what you need, you don't actually need the full st uh, string structure. They always have this property that you can break them down to just a specific collection of specific types of skip engrams that are enough to like basically figure out whether you've um, done these things correctly or not, all right? And so this is kind of like really the general upshot I want to give you here, which is that even though it looks like syntax might be using tree structure, the actual constraints, dependencies, and operations that take place in syntax seem to be using a much more, like they seem to be much more limited in a way where you don't ever actually need the full tree structure to make stuff work. All you need is these skip engrams, right? So now you might say, well, hold on a second, hold on a second, Thomas. I mean, aren't we still dealing with tree structure in there? Because how, where are you getting those engrams from? You're getting them from the trees. So you still have the trees. So the answer to that is, Yes and no. So the no part is just what I've been emphasizing the whole time, which is to say, look, the n-grams are sufficient and you can have distinct trees that have the same n-grams. So using just the n-grams really is a sense of like you're, you're, you're impoverishing your representation by doing that. So it's not the same thing as working with the trees. The trees give you additional things you could do by using all the information that's encoded in them. And it doesn't look like any syntactic dependencies actually use that stuff, all right? So there really is an argument to, to be made to say, no, there's something specific about those skip and ramps. And they seem to like be interesting for a syntactic perspective. But I will readily admit that, yeah, you are right, that right now I don't think anybody knows how we could actually compute those n ramps without actually first kind of like creating the tree for the sentence and then extracting the right relations from the tree so that we can infer what the n-grams should be. But that's exactly where I think it could get interesting to integrate this with large language models, because maybe this is exactly what large language models have figured out how to do. Maybe they're not actually inferring tree structure. Maybe all they're doing is they're using these more elaborate n-grams that allow them to relate elements in a string that are not in any kind of like local relation in the string, but are local relative to like these kind of things like being tier daughters and so on. And so that is actually something that I think would be interesting to test. And so like one of the next things I want to do is actually take a tree bank and convert it just to like really a format where we only get the merge and move engrams out of that. And then see what happens when you actually like train or test a model on that. Can, an L, uh, can a neural model, for instance, be trained on this and then very accurately for new sentences that it has never seen before, give you the right kind of merge and move n-grams? Because if it can do that, then I think that is suggestive that this might be what is going on, all right? So kind of like to wrap up here. So what was the general upshot here? Kind of like we have this tension between neural approaches and symbolic computation is a very, very old tension um, and it like it leads often to people talking past each other, but I really think that like there is lots and lots of interesting interaction that could be taking place there. I've pointed out some of those things already. I point out that what I think is very very uh, very very interesting about the LLMs is that they really give you models of the actual behavior, which is very different from the linguistic theories, which focus on the possible behavior. And so there is like something where like linguistics can incorporate insights from that. Um, but I also want to emphasize that, like, yes, there is now lots of work where, like, linguists are looking at LLM's performance and trying to assess that more accurately, and that's important work, but I think we should not stop there. And so what I just want to give you is kind of like a, a perspective of, like, look, what I've been doing is I've been looking at language steeped in, like, all the issues that syntacticians care about, like these weird things like binding and MPI licensing and so on. But when you do that through a formal lens, you do notice things that seem to be relevant for LLMs. and so. Specifically, as the like example that I want to give you was this idea of saying like, well, you know, maybe we don't actually need the tree structure after all when it comes to handling linguistic dependencies, and it is actually enough to just infer these kind of like skip engrams of a specific type and do everything over those. All right, and there's work to be done to see if that will actually pan out, but I think that is an interesting way of of bringing things together and not just basically relegating linguists to be kind of like the, um, yeah, the, 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 the human um, um, like administrators of various benchmarks for LLM models. I think linguistics has more to 
to give to the neural approaches, just like the neural approaches have more to give to, to linguistics, right? Okay, thank you.